a new training film before the MTSC meeting tomorrow. Won't take long. Okay, Pete. I'll see you both soon. Well, Sam, stick around. Let's see what this is all about. The party will have to wait. One good carburetor certainly deserves another. And here it is. The Carter two-barrel mixer for the 1977 Super 6 225 engine. As you can see, it looks almost identical to the reliable Carter we've had for the past several years on our 318 engines. Although throttle body bores for the 1977 version used on both the Super 6 and 318 engines are identical, the Super 6 Venturi dimension is smaller than the one used on the 318s. Internally, both carters look alike, but the Super 6 carburetor has new features you should know about. By the way, we still have the dependable Holley single barrel carburetor for our standard six-cylinder. Without lifting the hood, you can easily identify models with Super 6 engines. When the fifth digit on the VIN plate is a D, that's it. Now, you may think that each barrel feeds three cylinders. Not so. Although both barrels feed the fuel-air mixture into dual openings in the intake manifold, the mixture combines in a plenum-type chamber and is evenly distributed to all six cylinders. Sam, that's how the Super 6 gets its improved breathing and better all-round performance. Now let's compare throttle bodies used on our present and prior year models. For one thing, all 1977 Carter two-barrel carburetors have notches in the underside section. 1976 and prior models did not. Through these notches, manifold vacuum is applied to this port to act on the vacuum kick diaphragm and to this port leading to the inlet air door diaphragm, which is part of the heated air system. Because of this design, our new 1977 flange gasket is also somewhat different from what we've had in the past. Never try to install it on 1976 or prior model Carter carburetors. If you do... These restrictors function much like main metering jets. That is, the size of the small drilled hole in the idle mixture restrictors is precisely calibrated. In other words, you can reduce the fuel mixture flow at idle speeds by turning the mixture screw inward. But as the screw is turned outward and the idle mixture flow reaches its maximum, additional outward turns, even with limiter caps removed, cannot make the idle mixture richer. You see, Sam, you can only get so much to flow through those small restrictor passages. While we're on this subject, note the slimmer, more gradual taper of the 1977 needle tip. You could damage the idle ports if you use the incorrect mixture screws. And on top of that, Sam, those restrictors help reduce emission levels at idle speeds. Okay, so much for idle mixtures. Let's continue. Notice that air horn wall thickness of the Super 6 carburetor is greater than it is on models for the 318 engine. Because of this design, the choke valve now has more offset than in the past. Therefore, when the choke is on and the throttles are opened, Air velocity rushing past the wider section of the choke valve forces the choke to open slightly more. Talking about emission control, the vacuum step-up piston on Super 6 carburetors has a limited amount of free travel as compared to the 318 version. This restricted movement is accomplished by reducing the dimension between the upper and lower stops. As a result, when manifold vacuum drops during a light throttle, heavy load operation, the piston spring can only force the piston and metering rods upward a slight amount. 
Therefore, mixture levels do not become excessively rich. Now let's review carburetor adjustments. You'll need a set of accurate gauges, or you might just as well call the whole thing off. He's right, Sam. We just can't invent our own specs or make casual adjustments anymore. Now, before beginning adjustments, check the carburetor tag number. Then refer to the service manual in order to select the right gauges. First, check the fast idle cam position. Here's why. Since the choke valve and cam are linked together, we must be certain that at every stage of choke valve opening, the cam is repositioned properly to ensure correct engine RPM all during warm-up. To do this, place the fast idle speed screw on the second step of the fast idle cam. With the choke coil rod disconnected, push the choke valve toward the closed position. You should feel a slight drag on the gauge. If there's too much clearance, bending the connector rod here will increase its length and decrease choke valve clearance. On the other hand, if there's too little clearance, reduce the connector rod length in order to increase choke valve clearance. Remember, a choke rod too long causes too little choke valve clearance and produces inadequate warm-up idle speed. Frequent stalling at stops may also result. A choke rod too short causes too much choke valve clearance and produces excessive fast idle speeds and high exhaust emissions during warm-up. Now that we understand the importance of setting the fast idle cam position, let's get to vacuum kick. No, Sam. The vacuum kick is not a new way to score a point after touchdown. For the vacuum kick adjustment, select the correct gauge. Then, with a vacuum hand pump connected into the vacuum diaphragm hose, open the throttle to clear the fast idle cam and close the choke by hand. Release the throttle. Apply about 15 inches of vacuum, then slowly move the choke valve toward the closed position. The vacuum kick stem will pull out of the diaphragm with little resistance. Stop right there. Let's do that again. Too much closing pressure on the choke valve will force the diaphragm to stretch, causing the choke to close more than it should. So, take it easy on choke closing force. Check vacuum kick setting by inserting the correct gauge. Excessive clearance will cause too lean a fuel-air mixture and result in engine stallouts. On the other hand, too little clearance causes excessively rich mixtures and high CO and HC emission levels during engine warm-up. To increase choke valve clearance, close the U-shaped link here. To decrease choke valve clearance during vacuum kick, open the link. Now, let's look at how to check the choke unloader setting, often referred to as wide open kick. To do this, hold the throttle valves in the wide open position. This tang kicks the fast idle cam upward, partially opening the choke valve. Using the proper gauge, check the clearance at this point. If the gauge falls through the gap without any drag, or if it cannot be inserted without forcing the choke valve to open, bend this tang up or down as necessary. This unloader setting must be correct so that extra intake air can enter the cylinders during wide open throttle cranking to help clear an engine stall condition caused by momentary over-rich mixtures. Here's how to check the vacuum step-up piston setting. First, back off the idle speed screw until it clears the stop. While maintaining downward pressure on the step-up piston assembly, loosen the lifter sleeve lock screw. Push the outer tab downward as far as it'll travel, then tighten the lock screw. That's all there is to it. Now for accelerator pump stroke measurement. Turn the idle speed screw inward until it just touches the idle stop. Give it two additional clockwise turns. Measure the distance between the pump shaft and the top surface of the air horn. It must be at the spec called for in the service manual. A pump shaft set down too far reduces pump stroke travel. As a result, too little fuel is discharged on acceleration, causing flat spots and hesitation. No, Sam, hesitation is not a new dance step. A pump set too high has too much travel, causing more fuel to discharge on acceleration than is necessary. Fuel economy suffers. In either case, loosen this small lock screw. Rotate the plastic sleeve until pump shaft height is set correctly. Snug the screw down. Recheck the measurement. Now, depending on the drivability problem, you may want to check float level. Two methods can be used, on the bench and the wet check. We'll do the latter on the car. With the engine off, 
push the floats down so that extra fuel is forced out of the line into the float chamber. Now, make sure the fuel inlet fitting is tight. You may not realize it, but there's about a 10 to 1 ratio of movement between the float needle and the floats. For example, with only 15 thousandths of an inch inward movement of the needle, float height will change almost 150 thousandths of an inch. Measure the distance between the metal surface of the main body casting and the crown of each float at their centers. If out of adjustment, push the floats down to the bottom of the bowl, then carefully bend the float tab one way or the other as needed. A float level set too high will also cause a high level of fuel in the main nozzles. As a result, an excessive amount of fuel will be discharged, lowering fuel economy. If the float level is set too low, the fuel must lift and travel a greater distance. Drivability problems result. Once the floats are set, place a new cover gasket on the air horn. After the air horn is installed, reinstall the vacuum step-up piston and reset as described earlier. And that completes our carburetor adjustment. Well, Sam, that gives you an idea of just some of the things the guys in the shop must know. Say, would you like to see it again? Oh, Peter, let's get to the party. Can't we talk about those cute little floats and funny tangs later on?